Good evening from Boston College. My name is Tara Pisani Garo. I'm an associate professor of the practice in Earth Environmental Sciences, and I direct the Environmental Studies program. I welcome you to the show at six, BC and the Common Good. It's a pleasure to be with you this summer evening. The show at six features friends and members of the BC community discussing a range of issues affecting our world today, all revolving around the theme of the common good. Topics include how the BC community is responding to the effects of COVID-19, to the enduring challenges of the marginalized, to our resiliency and solidarity, and to the upbuilding of human dignity throughout the world. The show is based on the central insight of the common good. That is that the resources that humanity has and needs must be shared equitably. For instance, today each of us is called to promote the common good by social distancing, by wearing masks, by washing our hands. These practices, like other forms of solidarity, are not only for our own good, but for the common good. Before we get started, let me say a word about how the audience can participate. At 6.40, my co-host and I will ask Dr. Landrigan questions from the audience. Members of the audience can pose a question before 6.40 via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Let me repeat that. You can pose a question before 6.40 via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please identify yourself with your name and relationship to BC. And now let me introduce my co-host, Dr. Andrea Vicini. Andrea Vicini is a physician, ethicist, and priest in the Society of Jesus. Andrea was born in Italy and earned his med medical degree with a specialization in pediatrics from the University of Bologna. He joined the Society of Jesus in 1987, was ordained a priest in 1996, and earned a doctorate in theological ethics from BC in 2000. He's held teaching posts in Italy, Albania, Mexico, Chad, and France. Since 2011, he's been an affiliated faculty of the School of Theology and Ministry, and starting this fall, will begin an appointment in the Department of Theology, where he was named the Michael P. Walsh S.J. Professor of Bioethics at Boston College. Andrea Vicini's research interests include fundamental moral theology, theological bioethics, global public health, biotechnology, reproductive technology, end-of-life issues, medical ethics, genetics, and environmental issues. He's the author of the book, Human Genetics and the Common Good, and co-editor of Just Sustainability, Technology, Ecology, and Resource Extraction. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much, Tara. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Professor Philip Landrigan. As an alumnus of Boston College at BC, Dr. Phil Philip Landrigan is the director of the Global Public Health and the Common Good Program, and also the director of the Global Observatory on pollution and health. Both are part of the recently launched Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society. Dr. Landrigan is a pediatrician, public health physician, and epidemiologist. Author of over 700 scientific publications and 10 books, in his research, he uses the tools of the epidemiology to dissipate connections between toxical, toxic chemicals and human health, especially the health of infants and children. He's particularly interested in understanding how toxic chemicals injure the developing brains and nervous systems of children, and in translating this knowledge into public policy to protect health. Before joining Boston College in New York City, he worked for many years at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. After 9-11, he was involved in a medical and epidemiological follow-up with 20,000 rescue workers. From 2015 to 2017, he co-chaired the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, and in 2017, issued a landmark report on pollution, highlighting how pollution causes 9 million deaths annually and is an existential threat to planetary health. Let us focus tonight on uh, issues related to global health and the common good. And I begin with the question for clar clarification. You have been working in health your whole life. Can you help us to understand better the distinction between global public health and medicine? Yes. And what are the differences between the two? Yes, thank you, Andrea. That's, that's a good starting up question. So medicine and public health certainly have 
many similarities. They both draw from the same body of scientific knowledge. They make use of biology, chemistry, physics, all the, all the basic sciences of biology. But the difference, I would say, is, is in the focus. Medicine deals with individual patients one at a time. Anybody who's ever been to the doctor understands that. You sit across the table from a doctor and the doctor asks questions, does an exam. It's all about the one-on-one -on -one relationship. By contrast, public health is about the health of populations. It might be a small population like a zip code, it could be a city, it could be a state, a country, it could even be globally. But public health doctors use the tools of medicine to advance the health of entire populations, to prevent disease, to, to extend longevity, and just in general to pr promote good, good productive life. Public health has a couple of features that I think are very relevant to our conversation this evening. The first is that public health is deeply rooted in a philosophy of social justice. Anybody who works in public health comes to realize almost from the beginning that one of the defining features of patterns of disease in populations is that disease is not spread evenly. Some people get more disease than others. Some people are at higher risk than others. And it doesn't take very much investigation to realize that social, economic, historical, political, and many other factors are responsible for those patterns of disease, income, race, inequality, gender, all of those factors influence patterns of disease in populations. And so by, by dealing, by dealing head on and, and analyzing these, these patterns of health and disease and examining their relationship between social and economic factors, public health people are just intimately involved in understanding uh, up close and personal how, uh, how injustice shapes patterns of health and disease in society. Public health is also very much aligned, especially when we look at global health and planetary health, is very much aligned with Pope Francis' teachings in the encyclical Laudato Si, where he, where the Pope encourages us to care for all of our brothers and sisters on this planet and to care for the planet herself, our common home. Let us now hear from Tara a second question. Great. Um, so we're living in an extraordinary historical moment. Uh, as you reflect on COVID-19 pandemic, what do you think, or what are you coming to a conclusion about key insights that we should keep in mind as individuals, as healthcare professionals, and as a society in general? Yes, well, I, I think the first big lesson that the COVID-19 pandemic has driven home is simply how fundamentally important public health is to the sustainability of modern societies. You know, public health is one of those things in society that we tend to take for granted when everything is going well. Nobody was thinking a year ago this time about epidemiology, nobody except people in the field, were thinking about epidemiology or biostatistics or the mathematical modeling of the spread of disease. But suddenly these topics are in everybody's tongue because we've all been reminded uh, through this pandemic just how powerful dis uh, infectious diseases can, can be. And, 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 and how in, in the span of just six months from December till, till June, this pandemic has spread across the world. It's caused more than 8 million people to become sick and those are the ones we know about. It's caused more than 750,000 deaths many of those illnesses, many of those deaths could have been prevented if countries around the world, including the United States, had had more robust, better funded, better staffed public health programs in place that were poised to jump quickly on this epidemic. And we've seen the contrast between countries like Korea, Singapore, New Zealand, that had robust public health systems, jumped on this disease and squelched it very quickly versus a country like ours that takes a very laissez-faire attitude and the disease is still still raging. I just looked at the statistics this morning and in Arizona, the cases are going up at a thousand per day, which is just really uh, dreadful. And it, it means a great deal of human suffering is going to result uh, as a consequence and it could have been prevented 
Phil, can I jump in there? Were you surprised that our public health system wasn't better prepared for this? I mean, the United States is touted as having the best medical capabilities in the world. Um, did, did it surprise you? Well, we do a marvelous job in this country of treating people who are sick. We have some of the world's best hospitals, best cardiologists, best oncologists, people in all the medical specialties. If you get sick there and you have a little bit of money, there's no country in the world better positioned to take care of you than the United States. But we don't do such a good job on public health. Out of every healthcare dollar, uh, only two or three cents goes into public health. And over the last 20 years, we have gradually across the country disinvested in public health. We've disinvested at the federal level. Uh, the, the budget for the Centers for Disease Control has been cut where I, where I spent 15 years of my life. The budgets for state health departments have been cut. The budgets for most city and county health departments have been cut. And, and the result is that when something unexpected, predictable, but unexpected as to time and place like this epidemic comes along, health departments simply don't have the boots on the ground to mount an effective response. Could have been different. We could have put money into the CDC, but instead we took it out. Uh, we could have maintained a pandemic a pandemic preparedness desk within the uh, Office of the National Security Advisor, which we had until about three years ago, but we took that out. And the consequences we were caught unprepared and now people in this country are paying the price. I want to ask you one more follow-up question to this. Um, so in my neighborhood, um, I've been noticing for a number of weeks, really since the um, maybe first phase in of reopening, that young people in my community were probably most likely to not be social distancing, um, not wearing masks. I saw some teenagers huddled over a phone. That was in like May, sharing a phone and looking at something. Um, so, and recently now we're seeing some states have reported an increase in younger people testing positive for the virus. Um, what do you say about young people's role in this pandemic when they're maybe less vulnerable to the symptoms, but also are part of the spread of the disease? Yeah, it's not well, a community for us that has a, so many young people as, as the, at the heart of our community. Right, I, I think that's a great question because it, it comes right at the nexus of personal freedom and social responsibility. You're, you're absolutely correct. Young people are much less likely than older people to develop serious disease from COVID-19 or to die from COVID-19. They're, they're relatively protected by because of their biology, but they can certainly become infected. And once they're infected, like anybody else who's infected, they have the ability to spread the disease through coughing, through sneezing, through touching and so forth. And so I, I feel that when, when I see young people, and I've seen the same thing that you're saying, that, that, that it's the youngsters who are least likely to wear a mask and maintain social distancing, I, I feel that somebody really ought to be speaking to those kids about social responsibility and about the common good. Don't have to use those words, but they have to get the meaning across to kids that this is a shared responsibility, that it's not just about themselves, but it's about protecting the people in the society around them, especially the people who are more vulnerable than they are. Thank you. Um, Andrea, I'm going to pass to you. Phil, thank you. At the beginning, you mentioned in answering the first question in defining global public health and medicine, inequalities from income uh, to uh, race. And in the US in the recent weeks, uh, tragically, again, we have uh, noticed how racial discrimination still dominates the American context by creating great suffering for minorities and for the whole society. And we know that, as you rightly indicated, that this, is present, this inequality is present in health too, both in the US and globally. And the global pandemic has further highlighted how one's race affects one's social location, sorry, and one's social location affects how we are exposed and how our health risk increase. And also, as you rightly indicated, they influence the way in which we can have access to health services. So in light of your own experience in healthcare nationally, internationally, what are lessons that we should be aware of? What are positive elements we can highlight and uh, that can help us to plan and, or, and, and transform the healthcare sector, reducing 
or hopefully eliminating these inequalities so that we can promote the common good. Thank you, Andrea. So l let me start with the negative and then follow with the positive. So the negative numbers are pretty stark. Uh, in this country, there are differences between black and white and rich and poor on virtually every metric of health and disease. Uh, infant mortality, which is a commonly used measure of the efficacy of a healthcare system, it's the number of babies who are born who die in the first 30 days of life or the first year of life, is anywhere from four to six times higher in poor black communities than in wealthy white communities. In, in New York City, where I spent so many years of my life, you could go a distance of no more than three or four miles from the Upper East Side of Manhattan into the South Bronx, and you would see an almost eightfold difference in infant mortality between these two zip codes that are less than 10 minutes apart on a good traffic day. Um, likewise, maternal mortality and childbirth. Likewise, longevity. Uh, black people on average live shorter lives uh, with more disease than white people. We see it internationally, we see it globally. You mentioned, Andrea, when, I, when you were doing the introduction that I was involved in the, the, uh, the studying the, the global extent of pollution and pollution-related disease. A shocking statistic that came out of that analysis is that fully 92% of all of the 9 million pollution-related deaths that we see around the world, so about eight of those 9 million pollution-related deaths around the world occur in low and middle income countries. It's just striking uh, the, 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 the differences. We've certainly seen it in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, anybody who reads the papers has seen the statistics, the differential mortality rate between white and black, between rich and poor, between the, the much higher mortality rate in Chelsea, Massachusetts, a densely populated uh, ethnically and racially mixed community, compared to the suburban towns um, to the west of, of Boston College. A huge, huge discrepancy in, in mortality. Now on the positive side, we have seen some extraordinary gains made in reducing those disparities in recent years. One of the brightest places in the world, believe it or not, this is contrary to most people's preconceptions, is Africa. So in 1950, the infant mortality rate across the African continent was 187. That, that's to say that 187 out of every thousand babies uh, died before their birth, first birthday. Today, it's still way too high. It's 51 compared to something like four in this country. But nonetheless, it's come down by something in the neighborhood of two thirds. Likewise, in the same time span from 1950 to the present, Life expectancy in Africa has gone from 36 years in 1950 to 64 years today, close to a doubling. So what these numbers show, they're only statistics, but what they, you know, statistics are people with the tears wiped off. And, and what these numbers show us is that with concerted efforts that have been made by the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, PEPFAR, which was the president's emergency of fund for AIDS uh, initiated by President Bush. Th these concerted efforts, money, staffing, goodwill, have truly advanced the common good in some of the world's poorest, most disadvantaged places. Do they have a long way to go yet? Absolutely. But we've come a long way and we've done so in a reasonably short period of time, which gives me hope for the future. What, what makes me get up each day in the morning and, and do this work, even though sometimes it's it's a long haul and there's not much to show at the end of any one day, is you realize that if you're patient and persistent in this field, you can bring about an awful lot of good over a certain span of time. Thank you, Phil. And this can be very encouraging thinking at uh, the new generations, uh, the future generation of students who can make a difference, continue to make a difference in the field. Yep. Tara, to you now. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, your specialty in pollution and the relationship between air pollution and COVID-19 has been pretty intricate. Um, can you discuss the effect of air pollution on people's vulnerability to COVID-19? Um, and in that explanation, mention what, what we mean by air pollution and also the effects of reduced air pollution from the stay at home mandates across the globe on public health. So there's like the twofold part to pollution and the pandemic, if you could. Talk about that. Whatever you want to talk about in that subject would be great. 
So, like you said, it, it's an intricate relationship. It has, there are many threads here. Um, so, I think the piece of the relationship that has been most immediately in the news of late is a paper that was produced a few weeks ago now by, <clears throat> by a team at the Harvard School of Public Health, which looked at uh, the correlation between pollution and um, COVID-19 mortality rates by zip code in the United States. And what they have reported is that people who live in more heavily polluted zip codes are more likely to die of COVID-19. And the, the question, the, the, the problem is, is it wasn't a very detailed analysis. It was sort of a, of a first cut analysis. And you need to unpack the statistics to know what's there. First of all, I would certainly say it makes sense to me as a medical doctor that, that air pollution, which is fine microscopic particles in the air that people inhale into the lungs, and, and those particles tear up the airways in the lungs. It, it makes sense biologically that if the virus falls into, a, into an airway that's already been chewed up by, by pollution, that it would be more likely to take root and cause severe disease. But at the same time, you have to understand that the neighborhoods that are most polluted also happen to be the neighborhoods that are poorest, that are most likely to be inhabited by minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, and so in, in this correlation between pollution and minority status has been referred to as environmental injustice. It's just another dimension of racial injustice. So these things go together. And it's going to take further, further research to sort out how much of this pattern that's been reported, how much is actually due to pollution, and how much may be due to social and, and economic factors. But there's, there's other ways in which pollution uh, increases susceptibility to COVID-19. And in particular, I want to focus for a minute on what's called fine particulate air pollution. Fine particulate air pollution, which, which goes by the code name of PM 2.5, refers to airborne particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. So these are particles that are substantially uh, smaller than the diameter of a human hair. In the air, every breath we take, we inhale thousands, if not millions, of particles into our lungs. But PM 2.5, of course, is not spread evenly across the country any more than any other risk factor for disease is spread evenly. It's concentrated in, in poor minority neighborhoods. It's been concentrated along highways and near factories and, and, uh, and such. And over the years, people have done some elegant long-term follow-up studies of populations exposed to various levels of PM 2.5. And what they find when they follow populations forward over a number of years from the time of first exposure, they find that long-term exposure to PM 2.5 is associated with a whole series of diseases. First and foremost, not surprisingly, uh, air pollution is associated with chronic lung disease. Mm -hmm. but it's also associated with increased risk for heart disease, for stroke, for diabetes, possibly for chronic kidney disease, possibly for dementia. And in children, it's absolutely linked to low birth weight, premature birth, and, and childhood asthma. And so air pollution increases risk for all of these diseases, which themselves are known to increase risk for serious outcomes and mortality from COVID-19. So it's, it's, a, it's a tangled story. And uh, I think the bottom line is pollution is not a good thing. And it, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that at least indirectly and possibly directly, pollution increases risk of death from COVID-19. And I guess the, the other part that I have been thinking about too is that with the stay at home order, um, we saw pollution, local air pollution levels go down across cities around the world. Yeah. Um, in, in places that have been historically extremely polluted. So I'm curious about how that's going to play out in people's health. Just even if they have better air quality for two months, will that, you know, improve their, their, their chances of survival if they were to get COVID-19, for example? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. So the, these, these declines in pollution have truly been remarkable. Um, and they're visible from outer space. Uh, satellites that have flown across China, that have flown across northern Italy, that have flown across India and, other, and even across the United States have seen 
striking declines in the levels of pollution that can be visible that are visible from space. And actual measurements on the ground show a better than 50% decline in air pollution in New Delhi, a 30 to 40% decline in air pollution in parts of Europe, 25 to 30% in New York City and Los Angeles in the USA. And we know that already just from mathematical modeling that we've done in the past few weeks that those declines in air pollution have saved lives. It was calculated that in Europe in the month of April, 11,000 lives were saved because of decreased air pollution. In China during the months of January and February, that 77,000 lives were saved. Wow. And that's, that's brilliant, but that's not the end of the story because what, what this experience says to me is that it suddenly opened the eyes of people around the world to the possibility that pollution is not inevitable, that it can be controlled. Obviously, you don't want to control it by having a pandemic. But nonetheless, this, this experience shows that pollution can be controlled, that pollution-related disease can be prevented. And I think, I think that realization, which I think was not understood by so many people around the world before this pandemic, opens up enormous possibilities for what the world does during the post-COVID recovery. So we have a choice. We, we can just say, we'll go back to pollution, inequity, racism, and all the bad things. Let's just put this pandemic behind us and get it out of our minds. Or we can learn from what we have seen. We can take the trillions of dollars that are being put into these recovery packages in countries around the world, invest that money wisely, and instead of restarting up coal-fired power plants or building out natural gas facilities, we could put this money into wind and solar. And if I were an investor, if we had our colleague Jeremy Grantham on the show this evening, an investor would tell you that this is probably the best time that there has ever been in human history to invest in renewables. In the past decade, from 2010 to the present, the fraction of electricity produced around the world by renewables has increased by 400% from 4% of all electricity to almost 20%. The cost, the cost effectiveness of producing electricity from renewables has gone way down. In the case of solar, the, the cost to produce a unit of electricity has gone down by 81%. In the case of wind, it's gone down by 45%. And that's because the solar cells in the windmills and the other hardware, the transmission systems have all become much more effective. Goldman Sachs, who you usually don't think of as a public health organization, reports that in, for the first time in human history in 2021, there will be more investment in renewables than in fo any fossil fuel. And that's despite the massive subsidies that governments around the world continue to pour into the fossil fuel industry. So what that says to me, if I were investing for the long term, is I would get my money out of coal and oil and gas. I would put it into solar. I would put it into wind, and I would also write to my member of Congress and my senator and say, hey, there's trillions of dollars going through the federal coffers right now to restart the economy. Let's not waste that money on restarting coal-fired power plants. Let's put it into renewable energy. That is a great pivot to our, our next sort of topic. So, Andrea, do you want to take it from here? Yes. So, we could say, in light of this conversation, that the quality of life of the planet for the current and future generations depends on the two priorities that we should be able to address, health and the environment. We could say they are our common goods and together we could protect them. If we think concretely, how can we can promote this? At Boston College, the Global Observatory on Pollution and Health that you are directing is engage in promoting both. Can you tell us something about uh, concrete projects that uh, the Global Observatory on Pollution and Health is pursuing? And is there anything else we should do at BC to promote these two common goods? Yes, well, I, I, that's a very important question. So it's always been my belief as a person who does research in public health, but who's also interested in making change in the world, that people in our field have a responsibility to first of all, do the very best research they can, make the research impeccable and bulletproof to criticism, 
And then we have a responsibility to translate the findings of that research to the people in society who, who make decisions, elected officials, heads of government agencies, the media, NGOs, and, 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 and the general public. And, and so the, the, we've got three studies I'll mention briefly, and each operates in, in that mode. The first is been running now for about a year and a half, it's getting close to the end, is a big study of air pollution in India. We've been looking at the burden of disease, and we've also been looking at the economic costs of air pollution in India. We made the deliberate decision to bring in economists and look at the costs because we calculated that if we really wanted to persuade elected officials to take actions to prevent pollution and save lives, it wasn't enough to just talk about illness and death. We also had to talk about cost. Not because we assume that those people are venal or inhumane, but because they have many competing demands. And we calculated that if we're going to persuade them that preventing pollution is a priority, that it should be more important, for example, than putting another $10 million into the military or another $20 million into highways, we had to demonstrate to them that controlling pollution was actually cost effective, which it is. And in the United States, for example, <clears throat> we know that every dollar we put into the control of air pollution yields a return of $30. So we, we're advancing that argument in, in India. The, the second study we're doing is being undertaken in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're looking at the nexus between air pollution and economic development. Africa is in a very different place in its development than India. India is still a lower middle income country, but it's a big industrialized country with lots of cars, trucks, and buses on the road. It's, it's a fairly established society. Africa is still, most of the countries are still emerging economies. Uh, you looking, there's still lots of people that still burn sticks and wood in their homes for fuel. You don't see that in the United States and, and all but a few extremely rural places. They're at a very early stage in their development. And what that means is they have a choice. They, they, the fact that they're behind the West in their development gives them an opportunity to make some wise choices here that if they did the right thing, the leaders of those countries could actually leapfrog over a lot of the pollution that has plagued development in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and other of the, of the wave of countries that were the first to industrialize. And specifically what I mean by that is that if African countries decide right now to take advantage of their abundant sunshine and the cheap price of generating electricity from, from solar and from wind, they have no need to invest in coal. They have no need to import oil. They have no need to bring in natural gas. They, they could they could develop cleanly, they could prevent disease, and they could really jumpstart their development. And we, again, we've looked at the economics of this, and we're trying to argue to the leaders of African countries that, that wise investments in clean energy development would actually save billions, literally billions of dollars in those countries. And a further argument we're making has to do with the fact that we now know that PM 2.5 air pollution reduces IQ in children, when you calculate IQ loss across the whole population of a country, it's millions of IQ points. And so we're making the argument that if all the children in your country are less intelligent and less creative than they might have been, then when they grow up, they're going to be less economically productive. They're going to give less back to the society. The common good is going to be eroded. And so we're doing our best to persuade people by doing the right thing, by giving them a variety of reasons for doing so. Finally, our third big study is looking at the links between ocean pollution and human health. And we're, we're doing this study with the support of the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation, uh, the same people that brought us Jacques Cousteau. And um, uh, we have been working with a group of scientists from around the world to map out the extent of ocean pollution and trace the many different ways in which pollution of the seas can influence human health. Just to mention two very quickly, because I know time's moving on. Uh, one of the big pollutants in the ocean that we worry about is mercury. Mm -hmm. So how does mercury get into the oceans? 
believe it or not, mercury in the oceans comes from the burning of coal and coal-fired power plants. All coal contains little bits of mercury. When you burn thousands of tons, the mercury vaporizes, goes up the stack, travels through the atmosphere, and it comes down in the ocean. And once it gets into the ocean, it gets into the food chain, it concentrates and it reaches a very high level in top predator species like tuna fish, like bluefish, like striped bass, uh, and like whales. And if a pregnant mom eats mercury contaminated fish, not realizing it's contaminated, that mercury goes right through to her baby and can cause brain damage in the child. So that's one way in which ocean pollution very directly impacts human health. The second way is that when we release industrial waste and other toxic materials into coastal waters, a lot of the Mediterranean, the Baltic Sea in particular, what happens is harmful algae in the water propagate. These algae produce potent, potent toxins that get into people and can cause devastating neurological disease like instant Alzheimer's disease. And the incidence of that has, has been spreading. And so we're arguing that global leaders need to take aggressive action to control not just air pollution, but also pollution of the oceans. And ultimately, the beneficiaries will be the people of the planet and the common good. Um, Thank you, Phil. So, Phil, I'm going to try to wrap two questions up together in one. Um, and, and basically, we want you to talk about the new MINER program that's part of the Schiller Institute, so the MINER in Global Public Health, and also how is it that, that you came to do a pivot in your career from your research and, and running uh, the department in Mount Sinai to coming to be a director of a new academic program at Boston College. And I'm specifically thinking of Ambassador Burns last week talking about thinking about your career as having several acts. And so this may be one of your, you know, towards the, the your last act. <laughs> and so love to hear like how you made that pivot and tell us a little bit about the, the program before we get into questions from the audience. Sure. Well, the, the program on global public health and the common good at BC will be two years old in a couple of weeks on July 1. The, we started the minor last September. We had 100 applicants for 50 seats in the first year and 85 applicants for 50 seats in the second year. So it, it's clearly a very popular minor and it could be a lot bigger if, if we had more faculty. The minor is a six course minor. Uh, there are three required courses and three electives. The three required courses are firstly a course called uh, the Fundamentals of Public Health, or, or also known as Public Health in Contemporary Society. Secondly, an introductory course to epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of how diseases move through populations. It's considered to be the core science of public health. And the third required course is actually an option they can students could do one or the other of either a course on global health ethics which is taught by Professor Vicini himself or a, a course in public health law and policy which is taught by two professors at the BC Law School uh, Marianne Cherba and David Work and then with regard to the electives we have a long long list people across the campus have generously opened up somewhere between 50 and 60 courses as approved electives, everything from history to sociology to international studies. And we're, we're pretty ecumenical. If somebody comes to us with a, an elective that looks like it might reasonably impinge upon public health and most of human knowledge does, we say, sure, that's okay, you, you can do it. Because we, we want to produce um, graduates who know the basics of public health, but who are willing to take it into many different directions. Some will go into medicine, some will go into nursing, but we also hope that some end up as historians, social workers, um, lawyers, journalists, even politicians. Great, thank you. How did I get here? Yeah. Well, um, the BC roots run deep in our family. My father was a BC graduate class of 1929, and, um, and I was in 1963, and I had three brothers who went to BC after I did. And uh, my brother's children have gone to BC. Um, and going back eight or 10 years, um, I set up a relationship between the pre-med program at BC and my post at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, started bringing students down to Mount Sinai for summer electives. 
I was, was so impressed by those students. Uh, we had eight or 10 of them for summer. They were, they were very bright. But what really struck me beyond the obvious intelligence was just how altruistic and how dedicated these Boston College students were. And so that really got me thinking about, wouldn't it be nice to come back to BC for that next act and be, be part of an environment where people really were pulling together to try to make the world a better place. So there are a few steps in between involving Tom Charles and David Quigley, but that's the, that's the short version. Great. So I think we can begin to receive questions from the audience. As a reminder to the audience members, if we have questions for the panelists, please use the question and answer button at, at, and be sure to include your name and connection to BC. And thank you for joining us. Let us begin with the first question. The first one is from Sebastian Cota, an incoming first year student. And he says, he's very interested in making positive changes in public health, mainly around the area of health equity for undeserved communities. So Phil, what is your advice uh, for him who is uh, beginning his uh, college journey? Well, first of all, I'm delighted that Sebastian as an incoming freshman is already thinking about these issues and, and asking those questions. I can assure you that I was not that knowledgeable or that sophisticated when I entered Boston College many years ago. And what I would encourage him to do as he goes forward is that he, in the freshman year, if he can get in, and certainly in the sophomore year, that he take the introductory course to public health called Public Health in a Global Society, and that he apply to get into the minor, and we'll take him either in his sophomore or his junior year, and, um, and, and that he attend as many of the lectures and special offerings in public health that are available on the campus, maybe consider joining the Boston College Public Health Club, or the Climate Justice Society, and um, and just become knowledgeable about these about these topics. And finally, I'm on campus, or at least I am when I'm not socially distanced, and I'm always happy to see students. And if I can't see them up close and personal as I used to, we can always arrange a Zoom call. And I've been talking to students by Zoom all summer long. So if Sebastian wants to send me an email, phil.landrigan at bc.edu, be happy to talk to you, Sebastian. Phil, I was having a conversation with an undergrad student today over Zoom, and I basically made, said that you would be willing to have a Zoom conversation oh, with yeah. her about her interest in public health. So I'm glad that I wasn't lying today. Well, you weren't. You would never lie, Tara. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from Richard Porter, a public health lecturer at the Australian Catholic University. And he asks, um, culturally, the United States places great importance on personal freedom and liberty. I'm wondering if the U.S. faces greater challenges than many other countries due to many people in the U.S. feeling their liberty is being threatened, a barrier that many countries don't face to the same degree. Yeah, I think he's right. I mean, I've, I've worked in various countries in the course of my life, and there, there are some countries in the world where people place a much higher value, <clears throat> where, the, where the equation between personal freedom and societal responsibility is, is tilted very differently than it is in this country. I, I think the, the Scandinavian countries are a classic example of a place where the majority of the citizens place the common good above uh, uh, in the individual good. And it, it, it shows up in the incredible longevity in those countries, the relatively even distribution of wealth between rich and poor, not the complete eradication of social inequities, but certainly the, redu the reduction of the, of the severity in social inequities. So I, I think, I think uh, the gentleman from Australia is, is quite correct. We, we, we face challenges in this country that are the product of our culture and our history. And it's interesting too, because you also see in the United States a great uh, solidarity when we are in crisis and people coming out to help. So there's like that other sort of component to our personality, I think, that there is some common interest to help out and to lots of goodwill for that. So maybe harnessing some of that spirit of that American spirit, you know, once we're to get us through this long pandemic. You're absolutely right. Amer Americans have enormous capacity for generosity and, and 
I think we show it best in times of crisis. I was in New York when 9-11 went down, and it was very clear that people from every walk of life, from every variety of background that you can imagine, came together and worked as one to respond to that. And I think it changed New York. And I think even today, almost 20 years later, some of that change, some of the gentling of New York that took place after 9-11 is still, still evident. Neil, we have a third question from Tom Childs, a Vice Provost for Research and Academic Planning. You like uh, you to say something about uh, what Boston College is doing in the global public health arena, both in terms of research and academic programs. Right, well, I've, I've already mentioned some of the big projects we have going on through the Global Observatory on Pollution and Health. Uh, you and I, Andrea, have, have done some research together on the the ethical foundations of public health in that uh, approximately a year ago, just before the opening of school last September, last uh, early September, we, uh, we co-hosted a, a conference on the ethical foundations of global public health. And under your leadership, we're moving forward to bring out a book, multi-authored book on, on that topic. And we have a number of students who are doing research projects. I have several students this year who did senior theses on topics in global public health. One student who looked at global climate change uh, with a particular focus on India. A second student who looked at barriers to accessing uh, AIDS medications in different segments of American society. So there, there's lots going on intellectually, both at the faculty level as well as among the students. And uh, we, under the leadership of Jivinkina, we recently uh, were able to launch a task force on um, COVID that tries to you know, reflect from a faculty point of view on what are challenges for research and uh, for teaching so that we can share resources within university uh, on the one particular aspect of uh, uh, global public health. Yeah, and I, I think that particular committee, you and I are both on it, of course, is, is a very powerful initiative because we're doing it here at BC, but we're also doing it conjointly with the six or seven other universities around the world who are members of the Strategic Alliance for Catholic Research Universities. And we're trying to learn from each other and share strategies for advancing the common good in this very difficult and complex time. Um, there's a question from Mike McGonigal, a grad student, who asks, are there possibilities for cross-disciplinary approaches to public health, which may provide the theological and social justice urgency for just such a program as yours? Yes, is the short answer. Um, there, for example, there are people, I know people who are public health historians. I know people who are public health ge uh, geographers who look at the geography of health and disease. Um, I would say that Andrea Vicini might be a good example of a public health theologian. Public health is, is a discipline that touches many different fields. It's, uh, it's, it's a set of, set of tools. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way of looking at how health and disease uh, uh, are, are distributed across populations. And as soon as you start thinking about the factors that shape patterns of health and disease in populations, you're instantly in touch with 20, 30, 50 different disciplines, both scientific as well as uh, liberal arts disciplines. So for Mr. McGonigal, I would say that, um, there's a great opportunity to merge your interest in theology with, with public health. Study, for example, the distribution of disease in impoverished neighborhoods in Dorchester. Thank you, Phil. We have another question from uh, a first year student at Boston College, Shannon Liu. She has, the student has recently, even though air pollution is reduced due to the stay at home order, the demand for gloves and face masks has been, has been rising. Thus, there have been concerns over plastic pollution. So what can we do to reduce or prevent plastic pollution in our society that is caused and generated by this pandemic in this case? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question because it's basically, it's involving a risk-risk comparison. Um, I really don't like plastic pollution at all. The, the, we're putting something like 10 or 12 
uh, million tons of plastic into the world's oceans each year. And once plastic gets into the oceans, it stays there for decades, even centuries. So clearly anything that we can do to reduce plastic manufacture, to go back to uh, steel drinking cups like this thing or glass and get away from plastic, especially single use throwaway plastic is good. And I, I think societies around the world are already beginning to wake up to this. A number of countries and states are banning uh, single use plastic bags. They're banning drinking straws. And I think more of these common sense bans are gonna follow. On the other hand, people need to be protected against COVID-19. It's a life-threatening infection. And so there are times, I think, when one has to balance risks once, one against the other and say, I really don't like the fact that we're putting plastic into gloves, but we have to save lives here and now. And in, in that case, I, I think the use of plastic to make gloves or to make face masks is justified. And what then has to be in place is a rational sensible way for recapturing and recycling the plastic so that it doesn't just end up in landfills or rivers or ultimately in the seas. We have a question from Lisa Sowell Cahill from Theology. Um, she asks, do you have any strategies for changing public biases and motivation so that global leaders do in fact take steps on air pollution because their constituencies are demanding it? Yeah. Well, I think, I think when you talk about the attitudes of global leaders and effect, elected officials to pollution, it's, it's very important to think about the impact that money has in politics. There, there's enormous amounts of money goes into politics in this country and in many other countries. And huge amounts of that money comes from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and, and it can be said without any real exaggeration that the fossil fuel industry owns many members of Congress, many senators, many people at the state level around the country. So I think, I think a, a real impediment to attaining the common good that we need to confront. Uh, it's a real, it's an it's a ethical issue, it's a historical issue, it's a political issue, is how do we get this enormous flood of dark money out of politics so that politicians will act on behalf of all the people who have elected them and not simply on behalf of the small fraction of people who have given them large sums of money. And I think the, the only real answer in any society to solve, and in a democracy at least, to solving that question is for people to vote and to elect people whom they believe are honest and whom so far as they can tell through due diligence are not in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry. Phil, we are reaching uh, our closing time, but I would like to combine the last two questions. One is from Adam O'Neill, a sophomore at Boston College. And he asked if what you think are, in your view, the most promising local or national public policy to, to combat pollution in the air and water. And then Brian Garot, on the contrary, asked, uh, is a social dean for the core, he asked about Boston College. Uh, what is the advantage that the Boston College uh, Leader uh, tradition and uh, uh, way of educating the students uh, has uh, to solve global problems like climate change and heal conditions associated with it. So one global perspective and one BC perspective on both on all global issues. So I think the the single most effective public health intervention that societies around the world can make right here and now to reduce global pollution and to slow the pace of global climate change is to undertake a massive transition away from fossil fuels to renewables. It's happening uh, because of the economical factors that I talked about before, but we have to accelerate that transition. We can't wait till 2050 or 2060. We have to get it done by 2030 or 2035 if we wanna have any hope of holding global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that, that's the single most important thing that can be done globally. What's unique about public health at Boston College? When we were setting up this program, when we were setting up the minor a year and a half, two years ago, we gave a great deal of thought to that. And we realized that the single most unique thing that we at Boston College could bring to global public health is the fusion of our 
Jesuit Catholic tradition, our ethical values with the scientific knowledge of public health. The two are eminently compatible. Neither one of them gets in the way of the other. Uh, and we operationalize uh, this fusion in the course sequence in the minor by requiring on the one hand that students learn the science. They take uh, global health in a global society, uh, in contemporary society. They take the course in epidemiology. But at the same time, they either take the course in public health ethics or the course in public health law so that they understand right from the get-go that the science, the ethics, the quest for advancing the common good are intimately wrapped up in each other. There are lots of superb public health programs within a five mile radius of Boston College. Um, and we needed, when we set our program up, we needed to do something that made it distinct, that made it distinctively BC, that made it distinctively Jesuit Catholic. And it was this emphasis on the ethical foundations of public health that we chose as our distinguishing feature besides it's obviously the right thing to do. Um. Phil, it, it's hard to believe that an hour has just gone by, but um, we want to give you an opportunity to uh, make your any last comments or sentiments to our community about how we can create a healthy world so that all people can reach their full human potential. Okay, in, in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, so, well, you, you, could, you could take a minute or two. We can wrap it up quick. Okay, so I think I, I'm going to answer that in, in two parts. I think, first of all, everyone who graduates from Boston College, whether they're in the minor, whether they take courses in global public health or not, I hope will leave BC after four years with some understanding that public health is truly one of the pillars of modern society. It's simply not possible to have an effective operating modern society and not have public health. And if, they didn't, if people didn't believe this six months ago, I think they mostly know it now in the aftermath of COVID-19. But that's a realization that people need to keep alive in their hearts when they're voting in the years ahead. Remember that public health is important. Don't try to save a couple of bucks by taking two nurses out of the public health system. Keep, keep the system alive. Uh, main, maintain, maintain the workforce. The second thing I want to put out there is for students who are considering careers, whether it's in the health professions or in other fields, think of bringing public health into your career plans. If you're headed towards medicine or dentistry or veterinary medicine or nursing, uh, it's really important to have a population perspective to complement the perspective on the individual patient that you'll have as a doctor or nurse. But if you're contemplating a, a career in journalism or history or politics, if you know a little bit about public health, you, your, your education will be so much the more enriched and you'll be a far better, you'll be a far better person for it. I, I see a career in public health as uh, just like a career in medicine. It's a vocation, it's a calling, uh, it's, it's a passion, and it's a wonderful direction for people who are contemplating lives of service to, to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you to Tara, all the participants uh, who followed us on Zoom, those who asked questions. Coming attractions, June 26th, the show at six, features Race and Boston, the story of Dorchester. Uh, the speakers uh, will be Honorable Linda Dorsina Fori, a graduate of 96, current Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion and Community at Suffolk Construction and Bill Forey, graduate 95, editor and publisher of the Dorchester Report. Host will be Regine Jean Charles, associate professor of French, and Barton Howell, executive director of the Boston College program called Intersections. You need to register for each segment you want to attend. As you know, registration is very brief, but each segment has a different webinar link. So please check our webpage, bc.edu slash show at six, six is a number, and see the next segments. While you are there, you can check out our archives where all our previous segments are posted as you know, YouTube, uh, as Zoom recordings. So with gratitude, I invite you to be well and stay safe and good night from Boston College. And wear your mask. Bye everyone, thank you.
Bye. Bye.